chapter 2, verse 1 to chapter 3, verse 6. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had been home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them. Since they could not get to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above them above Jesus, by digging through it, and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now, some teachers of the law were sitting there, thinking to themselves, Why does this fellow talk like that? He's blasphemy. How, who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts, and he said to them, Why are you thinking these things? Which is easier, to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat, and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. He got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. Once again, Jesus went out beside the lake. A, cr a large crowd came to him and he began to teach him. As he walked along, he saw Levi, son of, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus said to him. And Levi got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. When the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said to them, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. Some people came and asked Jesus, How is it that John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees are fasting, but yours are not? Jesus answered, How can the guests of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? They cannot, so long as they have him with them. But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, and on that day they will fast. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. Otherwise, the new piece will pull away from the old, making the tear worse. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the wine will burst the skins and both the wine and the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins. On Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and as his disciples walked along, they began to pick some heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, Look, why are they doing what is unlawful on Sabbath? He answered, Have you, ever, have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need? In the days of Abiathar, the high priest, he entered the house of God and ate the consecrate, consecrated bread, which is lawful only for priests to eat, and he also gave some to his companions. Then he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord, even of the Sabbath. Another time Jesus went into the synagogue, and a man was a shriveled hand, was with a, a man with a shriveled hand was there. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, so they watched him closely to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath. Jesus said to the man with the shriveled hand, Stand up in front of everyone. Then Jesus asked, Which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they remained silent. He looked around at them in anger and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts, said to the man, Stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was completely restored. Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. Well, you will remember, I'm sure, in School of Rock, <laughs> when Dewey Finn is awakened from his hangover by a group of students who want to get him so that they can all go together to the Battle of the Bands and play the song that they've been practicing. And uh, Jimmy can't believe it. He thinks that every, it all is lost. It's all a complete disaster. Nothing's going to happen. He looks out the window. He sees the kids in the school bus and he says, No way. That is so 
punk rock. <laughs> that is so punk rock. Well, that's an interesting thing that for him to say at that point, and I wonder what you think he meant. Uh, the reason for this talk, by the way, <laughs> before we get into it, is to try to convince you to read Mark's Gospel and uh, to do that by making a comparison with punk and what it is. Now, if you just end up going, I, you know, just... This is stupid, Rob. This, this whole comparison is stupid. I, I don't even want to know about it. That's okay. I hope that you'll still go ahead and read Mark's Gospel. But just bear with me for a while, because sometimes these kind of comparisons can be illuminating. Uh, because we, you may be very familiar with Mark and Mark's Gospel, in which case anything that will kind of refresh it for you could be helpful. And it, it may be totally new to you and kind of inaccessible, and maybe this might just provide a bit of a way into understanding what's going on here in terms of the way Mark presents his story. So that's what I'm trying to do by the comparison. Okay, and really what I want to try and show you is how Mark uh, is a punk gospel. And uh, we've got a picture here. I want to try and explain to you why this man has a lot in common with this woman. And uh, so on the left there we have uh, an actual photo of Mark, <laughs> the follower of Jesus and writer of the Gospel. And on, on the right, uh, of course you'll know that that is Susie Sue, the, one, of the, uh, one of the great figures of punk rock. Uh, so let me try and explain to you why they're alike in some way. Okay, so the legend of punk goes a bit like this. In the middle of the 1970s, rock music was in deep, deep trouble. Rock and roll, the greatest musical genre ever invented, had become a dinosaur and was in danger of extinction. Expert musicians with classical training wrote complicated songs for double and triple albums of overripe, overproduced, overblown songs full of obscure references to pagan religions, opera, and the difficulties of being very rich and very famous and very sexy. <laughs> Bands spent months and months in the studio perfecting self-indulgent songs that went for six or 10 or even 15 minutes. And playing live, they exhibited their extraordinary musicianship by playing endless solos, including drum solos that went for minutes on end. The writer Nick Hornby recalls going to a Led Zeppelin concert and he got so bored in a drum solo that he went out of the venue, down to the pub, had a beer and came back and claims that the drum solo was still going on when he returned. This produced uh, the, that most evil mongrel offspring of rock and roll, progressive rock. And progressive rock uh, meant that people, less and less people were interested and disco took over the charts. Music so easy to dance to that even white men could dance to. <laughs> but then, suddenly, dramatically, in the northern summer of 1976, there was a musical explosion. Young bands started playing music that was fast and loud and simple and direct. It was rough and raw, and it took rock and roll music back to what it should be, about being a loser about feeling ugly, about missing out, about being angry, and yes, about sticking it to the man. And uh, let me introduce you to some of the figures. First of all, in New York, this band, in 1976, released their first album, The Ramones. And let me uh, just tell you who they are. First of all, here we have Johnny Ramone, and then we have Tommy Ramone, and then we have Joey Ramone, and at the end, oh, sorry, at the end we have D.D. Ramone. No relation to each other, uh, but that's just what they decided to call themselves. And this album, uh, which is just called Ramones, uh, is like being assaulted. It's, it's, it just takes music back to the time when people re thought that the electric guitar was not a musical instrument, but rather a weapon. <laughs> and it should be used as a weapon. Uh, and this is, this is a record which will just blow out the cobwebs and probably clear your sinuses, literally, <laughs> if you listen to it. Uh, it's just fast and direct and rough as anything. 
Uh, in London, around the same time, so this is in New York, in London, around the same time, this band, the Sex Pistols, uh, released their first single called Anarchy in the UK. And uh, really it was about a political program which mainly involved getting drunk and destroying things. Uh, other bands emerged at this time like The Clash and The Dam. <laughs> I don't know what, what, what happened there. <laughs> and so the centres of punk were New York, London, and of course, thirdly, Brisbane. <laughs> this band, The Saints, recorded their punk song, I'm Stranded, uh, and released it even before the Sex Pistols had re released any songs. Isn't that interesting? Anyone here from Brisbane? Shout out, good on you, mate. That's, that's your musical inheritance. Right there. Uh, and what happened really was that punk, the punk sound and punk bands didn't last that long. It really just kind of went for a year or two in its just pure form. But what it did was it unleashed uh, a whole wave of bands and a whole wave of creativity so that rock and roll, the greatest musical genre of them all, was revitalised and the next Six or seven or eight years were just fantastic years for music. Now you might say to me, Rob, I do not know this music, I do not know these bands, this is all just irrelevant to me, but I think maybe you know them more than you think you do. For example, just the other day I was watching Shazam and uh, the end credits came on and who should it be but the Ramones, I Don't Want to Grow Up. Do you, do you recall this over the end credits? You see, it's, it's sunk into your consciousness, but you're unaware of it. Okay, what about this one then? Uh, Guardians of the Galaxy. Just at that moment where they're finally getting it all together and they have a plan, and they, they, they have a scene where they do the walk. Okay, the walk is a cinematic cliche. It's a trope. Uh, and they do the walk, and what is the music? It's... Cherry Bomb by The Runaways, another punk, feminist punk song from 1976. Yes, you remember that one? What about this one? Shrek. <laughs> Shrek 2. In the scene where they're in the magic potion factory and uh, it all goes wrong and they have to escape. You remember this? And what's the song? Well, it's a punk classic. Ever fallen in love with someone you shouldn't have? You remember the chorus, Ever Fallen In Love With Someone You Shouldn't Have Fallen In Love With by the Buzzcocks, although it is a, it's a cover version there. Or, I, look, okay, you may not know this one, but I reckon, I'm willing to bet you know the next one, okay? <laughs> Jimmy Neutron, Boy Genius. What a great movie, okay. And what is the, at this moment in the story, Jimmy and his friends discover that they, their parents, all of their parents have gone away and they can do anything they want. So what kind of music do you need for that? <laughs> Punk music. And it's the Ramones Blitzkrieg Bop. Um, that's also in Spider-Man Homecoming when he gets his costume and he puts it on for the first time and he starts going crazy in that kind of montage scene. It's all there. So what you know this music and what's it for? It's music for going crazy to. It's music for when you've actually decided to do something and you go ahead and do it. Well, I just want to show you uh, some ways in which Mark, Mark's gospel is punk. And uh, just refer to the passage that we read today. And uh, first of all, I just want to uh, point out that uh, Mark's gospel is punk in the way that it's so immediate. The thing about punk music was it was meant to be very simple and very direct. No mucking around, no complications, just go straight into it. Let me refer you to one punk song. The Buzzcocks second single, What Do I Get? And uh, this is how it goes. I just, I was, I was watching the timer here. Uh, from the start of the song to the first verse, seven seconds. Okay, so we just get seven second intro and then first verse. I just want a lover like any other what do I get? I only want a friend who'll stay to the end. What do I get? Chorus, what do I get? Oh, what do I get? 
what do I get? Oh, what do I get? That, that's it. That's just <laughs> straight at you. It's just straight at you. And what happens in Mark's Gospel? It's straight at you. you. We heard two weeks ago when we read the start of the Gospel, Mark just throws us straight into it. We get just the, the briefest introduction. God is going to keep his promises. John the Baptist came saying, get ready, and Jesus arrived on the scene. And then we see Jesus uh, being baptised. We see him being tempted. We see Jesus start his proclamation saying, God's kingdom is coming. Everyone needs to repent and believe the good news. 15 verses. All of that in just 15 verses. We're straight into it, straight away. And here uh, in the passage we heard read, we just see Mark just take us straight into the controversies that Jesus starts getting involved in. And he just gives us five in a row. Bang, 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 bang. And we're just thrown straight into action. Jesus comes back to the house. What house? I don't know. The house that Jesus is staying in. And a bunch of people come in there and it's so crowded you can't even get in the door. So some people come along and they make a hole in the ceiling and they lower a man down through it. But hold on, what, who, how did they do that? And what happened? And didn't people get angry? And how did they lower him down? And what? We have so many questions about it. Mark just takes us there and just tells us what happened. It's just the bare bones of the story. And we see Jesus healing. Jesus walks up to Matthew's, uh, Levi's tax collection booth and says, follow me. And Mark tells us, he got up and followed. That's so punk rock. <laughs> it's, now look, maybe there was some other conversation, I don't know. It's, but Mark is just giving us the basics here. And he just uh, takes us through it again and again. Uh, we're plunged into the action and straight away we see vividly, directly what Jesus was doing. Second way that Mark is punk in the, is in the way that it's relentless. Uh, the Ramones live album from Christmas Eve 1977 goes for 60 minutes. It's called It's Alive. It goes for 60 minutes. It contains 30 songs. Now, they may have cut out some of the bits in the middle, but I don't think so, just looking at the video, which you can look at on YouTube if you want to. Just put in Ramones Rainbow Theatre, New Year's Eve 1977, or something along those lines. And they just play a song, and before the, the audience tries to applaud and go wild and clap, they've already started the next song. They just, it is totally relentless. And listen to the way that Mark does it here. We get one story, and then another story, and another story, and another story. Um, you can read Mark's Gospel in less than 60 minutes. You can read it, probably read it in about 50, 55 minutes. And there, there must be 70 episodes in there. there must, there's an incredible number of, depends how you cut it up, an incredible number of things happen. It's just uh, piled up on us, and you just, the thing is, if you read it through like this, you just get an impression of, it's like Jesus just kind of hitting you. We're very used to just taking an isolated bit of it, right, and just reading a small part. And I didn't want to do that tonight. I wanted us to hear five in a row. And it was really great the way it was read for us really quickly, which was requested. It was just you're catching your breath about, hold on, the paralyzed man. And Jesus is gathering followers. And hold on a minute. They're having a conversation about. And then hold on. And then it's amazing the way that it just builds and builds and builds. And it's not abstract. It's not, there's no philosophy, there's no ideas, it's just about a person and the things that they did. And it builds and builds and builds. But it's not random, actually. It might feel like it's just piling on the different incidents in a random way. But Mark is being a bit more deliberate than that. So what I want you to do is, we've got five incidents here. And I want you to look at these and talk to the person next to you. I want you to try to work out what are, the, what are the, the themes or ideas in each of the five and how they connect with each other. So you have to do this really quickly. What are the main themes or ideas or words or plot lines in each of the five incidents? And how do they connect? Talk to the person next to you about that.
Thanks for doing that. Sorry to rush you a bit at this point. What, what are some of the connections that people found between the five incidents? Yes, okay, so we've got the, the Pharisees uh, through it at various points. Jesus is in there. All five, yeah, all five of them are connected by Jesus. Can we make some more specific uh, connections than that? Thank you, Brian. Jesus has something confusing in all of it. <laughs> They're all confusing, yes, thank you. Um, he says and he does whatever he wants <laughs> yes, that's interesting. Okay, can you can you can you see any connections just between two of them, say, or two or three of them at once? Thematic issues. Question. Yep. Well, last two about the Sabbath. The last two, about, yes, controversies regarding the Sabbath. Yeah. Uh, the first two's, the first one's about. Jesus having the authority to forgive sins on it. And the second one's about him coming to all the sins. Yeah. First two are to do with sins and forgiveness. Yeah, very good. What else? There's a mirror uh, of healing. The first one and the last one. First one and the fifth one are both about healing. So you might ask yourself, well, maybe what do the second one and the fourth one have in common? about food. Both about eating. And what's the third one about? <coughs> about not eating. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> so Mark is doing something really pretty cute here, actually. It's, you, we didn't notice it, but it's actually highly structured. And there's themes and patterns there. It's a bit like a song, actually. <laughs> Uh, it might seem like it's just coming at you as noise, but there's, there's a lot going on there under the surface, yeah. So it's, it is relentless in its way, but it's not, it's not just noise. It actually is pointing out some really important things about Jesus. And one of the things that people have said about this kind of pattern is that it draws our attention to, the, to what's in the middle. So we might come back to that in a second. Yeah, okay, that's great. All right, so Mark is punk because it's immediate and relentless, uh, and I think also because it's controversial and confrontational. And this is what punk was like. I think Andy pointed this out to us, and uh, just let me remind you, if you weren't here, that uh, the Sex Pistols' uh, second single was called God Save the Queen, and that was the, the, <laughs> the visual. This was in incredibly, I mean, it's still pretty confrontational, I think. But imagine that you were an English person in 1976, early 1977. It's just, it's outrageous. It's, it's so outrageous. How dare they do that to our sovereign lady? So uh, this is the kind of confrontation. It was you know, a very deliberate kind of confrontation. Now, the story that Mark tells about Jesus is also very confrontational, but not just in a way that's a gesture, but in in the consistent way that Jesus challenges the authorities of his day. And you see that through this whole section. At, at each point, um, Jesus is disappointing people's expectations about him and asserting something about himself which challenges them uh, to think about who he is. Jesus has authority to forgive sins. He has authority over the Sabbath. He is the doctor for sins. Uh, he's, by implication, greater than David, great King David. He's the bridegroom, whatever that means. He compares himself to new wine, being poured into an old wine skin. At each point, Jesus is saying that actually there's conflict here because something new is happening and people need to either get with it or not. And this is what Jesus is saying in the middle part, isn't it? He's the bridegroom. The bridegroom is an image from the, from the Bible, uh, usually used in the Old Testament, of God. That God is like the, the, the husband or bridegroom, and his people are like his wife or his betrothed, his fiancée. And he, Jesus is actually using that language about himself now. He's the bridegroom, and the bridegroom is here. Something is going on, and it's different from everything that's happened in the past. 
uh, Jesus uses those stories about the cloth, the shrunk cloth and unshrunk cloth, or the wine and the wineskin. Jesus is the new thing that is happening. Jesus is a new thing that God is doing. And so that's, that's not going to fit in with the old stuff anymore. You've got to make a choice. You're going to stick with the old stuff or you're going to go with the new stuff. And in, in doing that, Jesus was being pretty punk. He was saying, you, actually, you're being confronted and you have to make a decision. And Mark is punk because it's risky. It's risky. In making that kind of music, uh, the, those those punk bands were doing something that had no assurance of success. And in fact, they were mostly ignored at the time. Uh, they could have tried to make music, which was you know, safely commercial, but instead they tried to make something that was new and passionate and real and raw, and they didn't know what would happen with that. But actually, Mark tells a story that's even riskier than that. Right from the beginning, Mark says that Jesus is God's son, um, and here we see Jesus putting himself forward as the one who can say how God's Sabbath is meant to be uh, observed. He's the one who puts himself forward saying that he can forgive sins, something only God can do. Jesus puts himself forward as the new thing that God is doing. And uh, actually it means that Mark continues to be risky for readers of Mark who take the message seriously. That if Jesus really is Lord and he's the boss in these ways, then that changes everything about our lives. That just changes everything. Um, it means that nothing else is Lord. Nothing else is the boss. And Jesus is what really matters. He's the one who can forgive sins. He's the one who can heal the sick. He's the one who can set people free. He's even the boss of the days of the week. And so Mark tells a story of something that's going to be risky for us if we take it seriously and follow it. And uh, it's also risky just in the thing that Mark does because what Mark is doing here is something that no one has ever done before. And uh, let's go back to the, that comparison with Susie Sue. Uh, and this uh, Susie was uh, actually originally a, a groupie of the Sex Pistols. She followed the band. She dropped out of school when she was 17. Uh, she became a follower of the band, the Sex Pistols. But then she started to say to herself, you know, they're actually pretty rubbish and I can do better. <laughs> and she did. She formed her own band. Uh, the first gig that they ever got, they didn't have any songs. So for 20 minutes, the band just played some, made up some music while she intoned the Lord's Prayer over the top of it. Uh, which, that's, that's so punk rock. Uh, and, but eventually they learned to play their instruments and she just recorded some great music. And it's this kind of have a go uh, idea which was just the essence of what punk was about. That anyone could try this, anyone could have a go. That rock and roll music is meant to be made up in garages, not music studios. And, uh, and this is what she did. And you might compare it with something like the progressive rock of the, of the mid-70s. Because even its best examples, and look, here you could think about something like, you know at the start of Guardians of the Galaxy 2, there's that fabulous scene, uh, and the music is Mr. Blue Sky by ELO, right? And this is, this is perhaps the epitome of progressive rock. And... It's a great, great sound. It works so well, right? But no one listening to that song or any of the songs from that ELO album, which is from 1977, ever thought, you know what? I could do that. No one ever. Listening to it, you, you listen closely to it, you, there is no way you could ever do anything like that because you're just not that good, right? <laughs> but with punk music, people listening to it thought, I could do that. It was this, yeah... And so the whole spirit of the thing was, I'll have a go. I'll have a go. Don't care if I fail. I'll just have a go. And, uh, well, what about Mark? What do we know about Mark's story? Uh, interestingly, we first meet Mark as uh, just pretty much, a, sounds like he was a, a young man or a boy. Uh, the, apostle, Pe the apostle Peter comes to stay at his house in the book of Acts. And then a little, little bit later on, we have 
uh, Mark being taken on, taken by Paul and Barnabas on their missionary journey. But Luke tells us in the book of Acts that Mark gave up, that a little bit into the journey he went home. And it doesn't say he chickened out, but that's pretty much the implication. He, he gave up and went back home. And, you know, the story could have ended there. But apparently, no, he kind of got his courage back and had another go. And he's mentioned as a companion uh, of Paul again later on in the story. He's mentioned uh, as uh, being in Rome with Peter. And uh, we, we understand from the tradition that he wrote his gospel there in Rome uh, with Peter telling him the stories about Jesus. Uh, and what's, just think about this in writing a gospel Mark is writing a kind of writing that has never been done before I mean they had biographies in the ancient world but the gospel is not quite the same thing and you can read biographies from the ancient world and they, you know, they're, they're not like this they're not immediate in this way telling the story of Jesus and especially concentrating on just Jesus last week you know, from chapter 11 to chapter 16, that whole huge section of the gospel is just about that last week in Jesus' life. So Mark was making up a new kind of writing for the new thing that Jesus was. And he was having a go. And, you know, he wasn't one of the 12 apostles. He dared to write down Jesus' story before any of them did. Isn't that interesting? That's so punk rock. <laughs> he just, he went for it. He went for it. And uh, most, almost all scholars agree that Mark is the first gospel written. And that later on, Matthew and Luke come along and they say about what Mark is, well, that's pretty good, it's a bit rough, <laughs> Greek's pretty poor, but we can work with that. And they, you know, they build their gospels on Mark's framework. John seems to say, I'll just do my own thing <laughs> uh, in a very different way. <laughs> That's so punk rock. So Mark had a go, and the tradition is later on he founded this, the church in Alexandria and that he was martyred there uh, in, the, in the 60s uh, by having a rope tied around his neck and being dragged through the city by a mob until he was dead. That's pretty punk rock as well. Uh, Mark's symbol is a lion with a winged lion. That's a bit more heavy metal, <laughs> but I still think it's pretty cool. Um, and that's, that is the spirit of Mark, of having a go, having a go. It's not smooth, uh, it's, it's, uh, but it actually brings us the story of Jesus in a really vivid, wonderful way. So, first thing I want to ask you is, have you ever read Mark start to finish? Have you ever read the whole thing? Because I think it's a great experience. And I want to encourage you to just sit down and make the time and try to read the whole thing in one go and just let it hit you like a Ramones record. Let it just wash over you. Uh, let it flood over you rather than picking it apart, rather than asking too many questions as you go along. Just let it, just experience it. And stop at chapter 16, verse 8, the original ending and just let that shocking ending hit you as well. Won't spoil it any more than that for you. They're just just experience it and uh, and feel it and let it have its effect on you. But I also want to encourage you to read Mark with someone else and to read some big chunks of it, not just individual stories on its own, and talk about it. talk about what this gospel is like and the Jesus that is presented to you in it, and that will be exciting. We've got copies of Uncover Mark, but of course you can use any Bible or any app that you want uh, and to get into Mark together. But I also want to say to you that the world needs more punks. Not in the sense of making fast, loud music necessarily, and I hope that you do make some at some point in your life, but in the sense of people who are just willing to have a go and don't really care what other people think. Uh, last week was pretty fantastic, I thought, and it was great uh, to hear students proclaiming Jesus. I thought that was pretty punk rock. 
It was just really good. And, you know, Christian Union can do stuff in the university that's daring, that's bold, uh, that is actually in some ways saying, we, we don't really care what you think about us. We don't really care if you judge us. We just, we, re- we just really want you to get to know Jesus. And that's the kind of attitude, I think, that makes an impact and changes the world in God's mercy. Why don't we pray and uh, we can have a break, talk about that, have some dinner. Let's pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, uh, thank you so much for Mark's Gospel. We thank you for Mark and we thank you that he wrote this account of Jesus. And we thank you that it is so clear and simple and direct. Uh, we thank you for the way that it confronts us and gets in our face. Uh, we thank you for the way that presents Jesus to us. And we just pray that you would help us to hear about Jesus, to read about him, to get to know him, to get to love him. And we want to pray that uh, you would help us to help others get to know Jesus as well. That Mark's gospel might be opened in all kinds of places all over this campus. And that it would have its effect, the effect that you want it to have in people's lives. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.